Hello and welcome to the Cardiac Cats YouTube channel. I'm your host, Jacob Shorba, and today this is going to be our final video on the 2024 NFL Draft class for your Jacksonville Jaguars. We're going to go through every prospect. I'm going to give my grades on it, and I'm going to give my final grade for the whole class. I've given a lot of them throughout. I gave them initially when the picks were made, and I've already recorded some film breakdowns already on some of these prospects. So um, you guys have an idea of my thoughts on some of them, but these are my final thoughts, having rewatched a lot of these guys and just factoring in, like, what are they going to do with this team? What is the best case scenario for what this player is going to be in the NFL with the Jaguars? And what's that worth in the draft? Because that is a big conversation with where we're going to rank these picks, what grades they're going to get. You know, it's about floor and ceiling and how likely players are to get to each of those things. So I'm really excited to jump into this. Um, we're going to go ahead. We're going to get started, though. We're going to talk about three guys that we've talked about before. You can watch the film breakdowns on my channel or some of my most recent uploads at this point. And then we'll get to Javon Foster, who I told you guys we would have a film breakdown on. Unfortunately, after I record the whole video, when I upload it, it was copyright claim by the SEC. I have not had that problem before, other than on a live stream. I have uploaded their content for quite a while without any issues, and so I figured it was fine. That has changed for some reason. Perhaps I just got lucky before. But unfortunately, I cannot do a film breakdown on him. Um, and if you want proof of me being able to do SEC content before, we literally were doing like a Mason Smith breakdown what, two videos ago? So I don't get why, but it's unfortunate because it really hinders our ability to show you guys what these prospects look like while we talk about them. And so that's unfortunate, but just the way it is. So with that all said, we're going to jump into the first pick for the Jaguars, Brian Thomas Jr. And with this pick, you know, I think the, the most exciting part of it was probably the fact that they were able to move back and get so many picks to go along with this. They got pick 167. They got a third rounder next year and a fourth rounder next year, all from Minnesota, which Minnesota right now, I would not be shocked if they are one of the worst teams in the NFL. I really like the vision that they have. I like the way that they're going, but I think just part of drafting J.J. McCarthy was always going to be probably not having a good first year while he's there. I think he's probably a player who sits, and so these are valuable picks that the Jaguars acquired next season you know, we could be talking about getting 72, getting like a 108, and then getting 167 this year. That's a very good trade for Jacksonville. I think it was a steal. Um, good pick by the Minnesota Vikings, of course, to get Dallas Turner. But the value of what Jacksonville got back was incredible. And that factored a bit into this grade for Brian Thomas Jr. Now, I had him ranked 25th on my big board. And that's what the reference is at the bottom of the screen. It's not to consensus across the community. This is where I had them and who I watched. And so this pick really throughout the whole process, well, I didn't talk about it a ton. It always made sense because you get a player who has incredible physical talents and athletic talents that Trent Baalke is going to fall in love with. We knew that from the start. You get someone who, at least at the start of the offseason, was bringing something the team was missing. That is a vertical, deep threat receiver with a big frame. Now, of course, did they go out and sign Gabe Davis before this? They did. And I think that's part of what factors into where I have this grade falling. Because I think if you had a better complementary piece, maybe it's an A. You know, maybe it's an A minus, an A, somewhere in there. But I think early on, as Brian Thomas Jr. develops, they're probably going to be a little bit redundant in some ways. And I'm not saying that they're the exact same player, but where do they thrive? It's going to be down the field. And I like that for Jacksonville. I like that they want to stretch the field. That was a huge problem I had with them last year. But you also want to have a balanced wide receiver core. And now you've got a ton of players who are going to go deep. you got Evan Ingram still, of course, um, who's going to be able to do it all. But I think they've very much put an emphasis on that. And so all these things considered, him being 25th on my board, you know, matching the value of the pick, I liked it and I gave it a B plus. I think uh, something I just want to say, Brian Thomas Jr., and I've mentioned this before, I believe, on here, and I've at least done it on Twitter, I know. 
I would give him a little bit of patience if he does not immediately break out and play incredible for the Jaguars. To me, he was a receiver that if he came back, if he declared for the 2025 draft, he was easily going to be wide receiver one. And I can tell you right now, having watched the top prospects in this class already, and that'll actually probably be our next video because we're going to start summer scouting here soon. We'll start with wide receivers. Um, I think Brian Thomas Jr. is better than all of them right now. And that might change, right? Luther Burden could have a great year. You know, he could be looking at Mecca Buga, Tetaro McMillan. There's a lot of other names we'll talk about in the future. But Brian Thomas Jr. probably will be wide receiver one. This is a very good pick by Jacksonville. They get a talented receiver, but there is going to be some patience needed because he was not the number one guy all the time at LSU. And Jacksonville needs to make sure that they're splitting the, the, the catches between these guys. They've got four players, I would say, at receiver and at tight end overall that you can split the load between. And I think it will work, it will work great if they do that. We'll see what they do. I would like them to take him on slowly. I want to see them develop him as a route runner. I want to see him get stronger. I think if he does all those things, you could see a similar career. And I don't know if it reaches the same ceiling. I won't go that far. But I think you could see a very similar career to C.D. Lamb and what he was able to accomplish. Lamb was not a number one elite wide receiver year one. He's gotten better every year. Last year, he broke out, and now he is one of the best in the NFL. You could argue he's top five at this point, and some might say it's not even an argument. I think Brian Thomas Jr., if you give him patience, even if things aren't incredible at the start, can reach the not necessarily the same ceiling, but he can get somewhat close to that. I think he could be a top 10 receiver in the NFL, and I hope he's even better than that. But that's my expectation for him. I think he's a good player for this offense. It'll be interesting to see how he fits in and what kind of role they have him playing, if he's going to run more routes, um, you know, from what he did at LSU, which was a little limited, and why we say he needs some development. So I like the pick. I mean, it's a B plus, and you'll see at the end uh, when we do the final grade, it's going to carry the grade quite a bit because, well, most of your draft capital is your first round pick every year. So it's a big part of it. Now, second pick was Mason Smith at number 48 overall. And these rankings below, I just want to clarify, these are my initial rankings before the draft. I went back through for the top three guys, even Javon Foster as well, and I evaluated whether or not I thought my initial grade was all right. And I felt like with Mason Smith and Jerrion Jones that the grades were too low. And so I raised them. Mason Smith, when I reevaluated, ended up being 70th overall. Jerrion Jones, I think, was 99th. So I have better grades on them now, which changes the grade here a little bit for just where he was selected. But at the end of the day, I think with Mason Smith, it's a really good fit here. And that's what kind of saves this pick from being even lower than where it is right now. I think there's some concern about him developing um i think he's got a long way to go i think he has some tools though and my ideal scenario for him early in his career with jacksonville is for him to be a rotational pass rusher to be developed in that regard i want to see him throughout his career taking the majority of his snaps there the goal in the ultimate ceiling for what mason smith can be at least in my opinion is that you have a very good pass rusher on the interior who can also get on the field against run plays, who can do good enough. He's not elite against the run. He's not great. I don't know if he ever will be, right? But someone you can put out there on those plays, and you're resting him on those run plays. So he could play a little bit against it, but that's where I want to see the rotation come in. That's the long-term vision. And if Mason Smith can get to that, which I want to reiterate again, Jacksonville is the best situation in the league for Mason Smith to be able to get to that ceiling. If he does, I think he's worth an early second. I think he may even be worth a late first at that ceiling. Now, could he be better? Could I be wrong? Of course I could. And I hope I am. I hope he's even better than that. But that's the ceiling I see that I see. And 
the low uh, part of this, the floor, unfortunately, could be a player who just never has an impact in the NFL, a guy who is a perennial backup and never develops. That is a possibility for Mason Smith. And so where do I think he lands? I really don't know at this point. I could see anything happening with him. But given that there were some really talented players on the board in the second round they could have moved up for, I've been very concerned with their ability to make moves at this point because I think they've proven the last two years that they cannot trade up in the draft. They've had opportunities over and over. They even said last year that they tried trading up, was it 20 times for Ventrell Miller? And they couldn't do it. Like, I have a concern about that, and I think that hurts the team. Because when you get into those situations, sometimes the guy who should be a steal there doesn't fall to you all the way. And even when they do for Jacksonville, you find a lot of the time that seems like they've determined their picks before the draft. Before their pick, they've decided this is going to be the guy we get. We heard on that Friday night where Mason Smith was picked, that he was a guy they were being linked to, that he was a top target for them. So that either says that they're putting him first round at that point, because this was like, I think, as the second round started, so you've got 32 players off the board only. So they either have him that high, which I think is a major concern, because that's like a ceiling at at the absolute best he's going to be, or they're ranking players higher that justify taking players that I don't think are really worth it at some of the picks. And I think Mason Smith could be really good for Jacksonville. I just don't know if he's worth 48 in a loaded class. And that's what makes this a D at the end of the day, because it feels like they're determining them. And they're trying to justify them, but maybe ranking players way too high on their draft boards that no one else agrees with. And if they're right, that's great. Fantastic. I want to be wrong. But that just hasn't happened <laughs> to this point. If we're being honest, Trayvon Walker is probably the closest to that. And he's still developing. He is in no way, shape, or form an elite pass rusher right now or worth a first overall pick. He's still got a ways to go. Now, I'd also argue that for other guys, too, that were supposed to be targets for the Jaguars that people said we should have picked. I don't think there were a ton of players worth the first overall pick. I think Sauce Gardner might be the only one, possibly. But the point is, Jacksonville hasn't proved us wrong on this. It's the same front office. I have a hard time seeing this being the best option they would have had there. And I think there were much safer options. You know, we talked about Chris Jenkins Jr. We talked about Michael Hall Jr. You know, if if you want a Michael Hall Jr., he's younger. He's got a better pass rush plan right now. He has just as much upside, I think, as Mason Smith. And I think he could be a good run defender because there's a good excuse for why he isn't right now. I just didn't see that with Mason Smith on the film. And Chris Jenkins Jr., has the pass rush upside, he's already a very good run defender. I think right now, how good he is, is probably as good as Mason Smith's ceiling is. Very close. Aya Jenkins is a late first. A very late first, given that. But these are the reasons why this pick isn't going to get a great grade for me. Because if it does, quite frankly, at that point, I think I'm being biased. I think I'm going against the things I saw in film. I'm just trying to give my team a good grade, which is not fair to you guys it's not fair to the evaluation and the hours that were spent researching these prospects over the last year so it's a d it has the ability to be worth more than pick number 48 they have to go prove that though and like i said at the beginning i think this is a phenomenal situation for mason smith and i really think it could work out here it's just in such a loaded class why take the risk when you have high floor prospects with high ceilings staring you in the face at your pick. Or you could have moved up and got an even better one. So that's my concern with it. Now, Jerrion Jones, pick number 96. I had him ranked at 140th, and he was among the players that I felt like got shafted by me because I did not spend enough time watching his film. And going back through it, I see a player that is a very good coverage cornerback, specifically in the slot. And I think he's got to improve in other areas. I think as a run defender, while he may be instinctual, while he may be smart, he is not a good tackler at this point. And that's not always something that improves at the NFL level. And so that's what really limits him to me at this point, because even if he knows where the play is going, 
all he can do is really hinder it if he can't get a tackle off. So I'm concerned about that aspect, but what I do think right now for Jerrion Jones, well, we want to have an outside cornerback, well, we want to have ideally filled it because that is a bigger need. That is a position that has volatility right now compared to the slot where you have Darnell Savage Jr. Just got signed for three years. So I think with Jerry on Jones, he is a slot. I think he is a very good rotational one. I think he can get on the field, and I would like to see him play against some air raid offenses. I want to see him play against teams that are passing the ball a lot because if they're throwing and he's in coverage, he's a very good player. And I think he's phenomenal in that regard. I think out of all the slot cornerbacks in this class, you can make an argument he's the best at coverage when he's in those passing sets. So I want to see that from him. I want him to get on the field in those roles. And hopefully he can improve his tackling. Because if he can, then we could see Jones end up being a starting caliber slot cornerback, a good coverage one as well. He can play well against the run. If he puts it all together, he's a good football player. At a position that right now, while it's not valued a ton, the value is increasing by the year for a slot cornerback. So I like it. I I think that this is a player who could be coming back for a second contract down the road if things work out as they want them to. And I can see the way that they could. I think another thing to note uh, just quickly They took a cornerback from a school that was running a lot of press coverage. That's a great thing, too. I think they're going to run a lot of that on this team this year. So it was smart to see them target someone from there. We talked a lot about Renardo Green, of course. He was gone much earlier. So I like this pick. Um, At first, I was neutral. I held my judgment because he was not a player. I felt like I gave a fair chance. I just did not have the time to go through everyone this year. It's something we're going to work on the future. But... Jones, when I watched him, you could see the talents there. I love his competitive um, mentality as well. That's something that stood out uh, listening to him after the draft. I think he's got what it takes to play cornerback in the NFL. He's just got to improve his tackling, and he could be a very good football player. So good pick by Jacksonville, but it's going to have a C-plus until uh, he proves he's a full-time starter and gets that ability to start with the team because there's a lot of – a lot of clouds around whether that's going to happen or not very soon. Now, pick 114, Javon Foster. I'm going to pull up my notes on this because I want to give this its due justice since I didn't actually get to talk about it on the channel. But Javon Foster was an early favorite of mine in this class, someone I liked. Um, I felt like watching him at first, looking at like PFF data, this was a good football player. And it was shocking to me that he was ranked so low by the consensus for most of this process. He was a late third, early fourth round pick for much of it, if not much later. But he's got a lot of experience. He is 24 years old. You can look that as a detriment. You can also look at it as a positive. He's he's relatively tall. I think he's got to put on maybe a little bit of weight, but he's strong in his upper half. He's got decent hand size, really long arms, great wingspan. His 40-yard dash was pretty bad, but I do think he moves around fine, um, when he's on the field. And so can he play in the scheme? I think he can. I think uh, what's interesting about this pick and what might keep it from being an A is that as far as the scheme fit and what he does best, I think he's better as a run blocker than he is as a pass protector. And, you know, if you followed me since I started recording videos, you know, even last off season, we've talked about it every off season that this team needs to improve its run block because I really think they're just kind of sleeping on, on like a diamond mine here because if Travis Etienne with how good he's played already was running behind a good offensive line in the run blocking game, I think that he would be possibly the best running back in the NFL. I think he might be the most productive. I think there is insane potential with him and I've wanted to see Jacksonville invest in these kinds of players. That's why I got so excited when they got Ezra Cleveland, because to me, he was a player that, while he was a good run blocker throughout most of his career and wasn't as good in pass protection. He was starting to put it all together with Minnesota. And that was the player that he was becoming when he got traded. He got hurt a couple games. People said that he was benched. That's bullshit. Quite frankly. Um, I I think the Vikings would have considered 
starting Dalton Risner, but I don't think Ezra Cleveland lost his job because of his performance on the field. He was in the middle of his best year, and Dalton Risner didn't have a contract until the middle of the season. So he was a good player, I felt like. And the, the big thing that sold me on him was his relations with the offensive line coach here. And then, of course, being a very good run blocker, something we have been missing. You watch Luke Fortner, and it makes you want to vomit sometimes when he's getting thrown back in the face of Travis Etienne. He even saw it in the passing game, too. Like, he needs to develop. He should not be on the field right now, and we've unfortunately, I feel like, wasted a lot of potential. Now, ending that rant, Javon Foster is a really nice player to bring in that can help the run game and I think is going to be good there. He has a bit of an aggressive streak. He plays with a high motor. I think he is a good run blocker right now. He's a physical player too. Now, as a pass protector, and what stops me from joining the train of this could be the future left tackle, and he could be good enough to start somewhere, I think that the the, the refinement in his game, the decision-making, is all very slow right now. I don't think it's good enough. A lot of plays, it feels like he's losing leverage. He's not anchoring well. He's also very top heavy, which I think plays into why he's a better run blocker than a pass protector. Because when you're getting on the move, he's got more weight in his upper half to go slam guys down to the ground. But when you're trying to anchor, all your weight's in your top half, which is what's getting pushed back. And you can't have as much power in your legs because your weight's not distributed there. So I feel like He's a better run blocker for those reasons. I think these things hurt his pass protection. He's a top-heavy player. I feel like when he's fighting with his hands, you see him stop moving his feet. He needs to coordinate his legs and his arms better. And then, you know, athleticism, like I could say, yeah, it's not elite. I think it's good enough, though. I, I want to see him improve in a lot of these regards. And the final thing, um, he did have a lot of penalties this last year. He had 10 penalties with the Mizzou Tigers. So I'd like to see those things improve. I think that he could get better, but he is a guy who is 24 years old heading into the NFL. It's not super common that you see older players come in and then all of a sudden they're just developing super fast. When you're an older player, when you're a veteran and you still have those problems, it kind of limits what I see the ceiling in you as. And so Javon Foster, I think you know what you're getting. It's not bad. It's very good. I think, um, you know, my, my 88th overall ranking, I left it where it was. I thought that was fair. And that's exactly probably where I would have taken him. He was a steal for the fourth round, in my opinion. He is a rotational tackle, or we'll call it a swing tackle. That's better terminology. He can come in and start if he has to. He is not an ideal starter. He is not the guy you want to start. But he can do it, and he should have a long NFL career for those reasons. I'm really excited to see him get an opportunity this preseason. Hopefully he can develop because it'd be cool to see one of your guys succeed in the NFL, and he was one of my guys this last year, someone I liked very early on. But I think that he's going to be a nice addition. I think he is logically at this point probably the Walker Little replacement, given Walker Little probably won't return. We're going to need another swing tackle. And this helps out that position a little bit next offseason because if you didn't make this pick, the only tackle you got is Anton Harrison. Everyone else is walking at that point. You got to resign them. You got to figure something out. You got to draft a guy. I still think they're going to have to, but you get an insurance policy. And so I really like this pick for those reasons. This was the only pick in the entire draft class um, that I felt like was taken later than he should have gone based off my big board. And of course there's some guys later we'll talk about that. I didn't get to rank wasn't because they were necessarily bad. Maybe it's position or I just wasn't able to get to that many prospects, but this was a really good pick it is the one certified steal for me in this class. Now one sixteen, Jordan Jefferson. I have not watched a ton of him. But when I've watched him, I have not been super impressed. I think realistically, he's probably going to be a run stuffer. That's sorry. My voice just died there. Um, that is used in a rotational element. I think not being a heavy part of the rotation and the goal and probably the ceiling of this pick is for him to be a solid run defender 
that you can use in that role. You don't want them on the field for other downs, but that's where you're using them. And the Jaguars have needed to add players to the defensive line. I understand that. I just don't really think this pick is going to work out. I could be wrong for sure. But I just wasn't super impressed with Jordan Jefferson. I'm not going to spend a ton of time on him here for that reason. I think there is the possibility this could be a player that doesn't even make the roster in a couple years. I don't know if he'll play out his whole rookie deal here. I hope he does. Um, I'd love to be wrong. When, it, when I'm down on something or, or when I'm um, maybe underrating a player, I hope, I hope I'm wrong. But I just don't really see it with Jefferson. You've also got the concerns about him ripping off his helmet at one of the practices and going after a guy. Um, I actually think he ripped off the other guy's helmet. But there's just some things I'm not, not a huge fan of. And I don't think it's going to be worth that pick, especially when you consider players were still falling around that point. TJ Tampa was on the board. He's a press corner. Like, I know he's not fast. Um, that's the big concern. Still good enough, I feel like. There's just players it feels like they just ignore because they didn't have plans to draft him. It's almost like they have no ability to shift and divert to an air draft strategy because someone falls down the board. Like Antonio Johnson, they had to skip on him four times before they took him or however many. It was a lot of picks, right? He had like 13 that year. But it just kind of feels like they do that every year, and it's disappointing because you're not going to get steals late in the class. You're not going to elevate your team in situations where you weren't expected to, and that's how you become a contender. That's how you have a deep roster. That's how you have a plan when a guy goes down or you steal a starter deep in the class. They did that with Antonio Johnson, thankfully. I think they lucked into that, and this is an example of them just kind of ignoring guys. So I don't like that, but... It is what it is. Now we got four more prospects left here. Getting pretty deep into the class. Down to 153 here. DeAndre Prince is the only guy that I had in my final prediction for the draft that actually got picked by them. It was just much earlier. And I didn't really know where Prince was going to go. It's not super shocking, though, that he went, you know, early to mid day three. Watching him, you know, I could see how he could become a starting cornerback in the NFL for sure. It's honestly been a while since I've seen his film, but I felt like there was a little bit of a concern maybe in run defense and the physicality, but I think that's stuff you can improve. I think he's a really good candidate to develop with the Jaguars, and maybe he could be a starter for them down the road in the best-case scenario. I don't think that will be the case, but I think he'll be a really nice backup to have. Add some depth to cornerback where you've lost some players, you've got some players that... You've had around for a while, like Monteric Brown, that I think he's coming into his final year at this point. So for DeAndre Prince, it makes sense. I think it's like solid value at that point. And it's a player they really wanted and they got him and good for them. Like I'm I'm happy about this pick and I think he'll be he'll be a nice uh, rotational player and someone we'll keep our eyes on in the preseason because hopefully one of these later picks can really step up and be a steal. That's what you're always looking for. That's what we're going to talk about in preseason. Just hoping that there's there's some sort of uh, light at the end of this depth chart. Now, pick 167. At first, I was like, who the heck is Keelan Robinson? And I think he was even surprised himself because uh, Keelan Robinson was saying he didn't even think he was going to get drafted, I'm pretty sure, when he got his media call. But watching some highlights from him in the return game, I can understand why Jacksonville made the pick, and I'll give him a C for it, because while I could just be like, it's a kick returner, it sucks, I understand their argument. They say they need two kick returners. They have one right now in Devin DuVernay, who's very good. I think he'll be really nice to have there to help out Keelan Robinson uh, developing his game in that regard. I, to make it clear, I don't see Robinson as a running back that much for Jacksonville. I don't think he gets into that rotation more than maybe a couple plays a game at most we'll see what happens of course but i think he's going to be a, a good return man he has some explosive speed on film i really hope that they just snagged a really good returner here and if they did if if he's good at all then i think the pick's worth it at this point you know i it, some of this is kind of house money too because uh you're you got so many picks from minnesota you got so much draft capital there and 
I like it. I think he could be good. I'm excited to watch him. He'll be a fun person to see in the preseason. Hopefully he brings one back for a touchdown, makes it exciting. Always love seeing those plays, but um, really happy for him to come here, and I, I hope he's a good return man. I think he's in a good situation to develop his game behind one of the best in the NFL. Now, another pick I really love, and actually the highest grade I'll give out in this entire draft class, it's Cam Little. Gave it an A+. Plus. I couldn't do S. We, we have a S tier at the very top that I use. Um, the reason why I didn't do S is because it's a kicker, right? It can always go wrong. It's always possible. But Jacksonville's pick was situated very well. They were right around when the kicker run started. And, you know, with, with the other two guys, Cardi, I, I thought was probably the best guy in the class. I felt like he had the best mix of being a clutch player, having good accuracy, and having kick power. Cam Little? I felt like had a lot to work with too. And he seems like a pretty mature guy and a really good fit for Jacksonville as well. I think he's going to be able to show up in those big moments. You get a really young player too. I think he's like the youngest kicker ever to be drafted, I think was what was being said. But uh, Will Reichard, you know, he's the air guy I talked about who went before. You know, happy Minnesota got him. They need a kicker. Um, if you've watched any of their games over the last two decades, you can see the pain they suffer for not having a kicker. But Riker, I didn't really believe in his leg. I, I didn't think he was a super strong kicker. I didn't think he had the power to be able to uh, convert field goals from further away. And this is a pretty big deal. You want to get a guy with a lot of upside. Jacksonville has emphasized that very heavily because Riley Patterson had a good year, just couldn't kick from far away, and they got rid of him after he had a game-winning kick in the wild card round. Like, crazy stuff but i think cam little is a very good kicker prospect i i think he's got the power i think he's got the accuracy i think he's got the clutch ability for me he would have been my number two kicker they got him as the third one off the board he's going to be here hopefully a very long time i hope it works out and, and at the end of the day maybe they have just resolved these kicker issues forever and i hope that's the case we'll see what happens i can't go out here and tell you that cam Little's going to be the next coming of justin tucker before he takes a snap it's kicker we just can't do that but a lot of upside here and could be a very good one in the nfl and just i love the pick i felt like they had to do it it was the pick i wanted at that point when you saw the kicker start going and they got him so Good for Jacksonville. Definitely my favorite pick um, when you consider the value of the selection and the player that they got, you know, because you saw just another thing to throw out here. Last year, the 49ers took Jake Moody with their first selection they had. I think it was pick 99. So kickers can go earlier in the draft. And the fact that they didn't have to spend an early day three pick to go get one, I think is a big plus too, because you see teams that get forced into that. Jacksonville was able to avoid it, and they got a very good prospect. So that's what gives us an A-plus for me. Now, final player here. <clears throat> Seventh round, Trayvon Walker. Miles Cole. I gave it a B. Sort of a weird one, because if you ask me, like, what do I think is going to happen, I, I don't think he's going to work out in the NFL. That's my guess. But seventh round pick, like, the upside for Miles Cole was ridiculous. Every time I saw him, during the pre-draft process, I would just look at the metrics and then be like, what the hell? Like, this guy is better than, like, every top prospect in the class. And then you'd hear about his film. And it just, there wasn't anything there. He just did not produce sacks. Like, probably one of the most unproductive, I think, six years, six-year careers in college football. And so... That's where you kind of got to tone it down. You can't be like, oh, this is an A+. Plus. Um, and maybe it is at the end of the day. I hope it is. But I think um, the upside and the fit makes a ton of sense. You need that position as well. I think they still need it. I'm going to make that very clear. And if you're wondering still why I chose their team to win the division this year, as of now, in my last video... You know, that's because we don't have depth at some of these positions. Like, and I think they missed some opportunities this offseason. And so what happens if Josh Allen goes down? What happens if Trayvon Walker goes down? I don't think there's a plan at this point. I think it's just, well, shit, we're screwed. And that's 
that's the plan. Um, so that's my concern, right? But this was a position of need. It was a very high upside player, but I also think very likely to bust. Am I going to crucify them for picking a player that would seem to bust in the NFL based off his college career? I'm not going to because it's the seventh round. It makes sense. It's the most Jaguars Trent Balky pick you'll ever see in your lives. Uh, maybe even more so in the Trayvon Walker pick, but I, I like it. I, I think it made sense. I, I kind of just laughed at it when I saw it, but um, I, I think it was one of the best players at that point. There were some other guys perhaps, but they also were UDFAs. Um, Michael Pratt was there, I guess, and he got picked nine selections later, the backup quarterback, right? But, like, I really liked his game. I thought he could be a, a sneaky starter in the NFL. And so to get that would have been nice, but I'm not going to change the grade because the one guy I wanted, they didn't get in the seventh round. It, that's stupid. So um, this is going to get a B for me. It's a good pick. One of their better picks in the class, but also the very last one and probably one that would realistically not work out in the NFL. Um, but we want to be wrong. And if we're wrong, we could be in for, for a huge steal. So definitely going to be watching Miles Cole this offseason, watching him in training camp, watching him in preseason, and, and throughout the first couple of years of his career. Now, to get to my final grade, uh, before I click the graphic here, you know, I was thinking to myself uh, what I wanted to do, and I figured I'd, get, I'd take all my grades for each pick, and then you take the total draft value of the class, so the value of the selections and then weight it for each one. So like the Brian Thomas Jr. pick would be weighted the heaviest because that first selection they had is worth more than all the other eight. So I did it that way and I was thinking C plus going in it ended up being a C plus. So I feel pretty confident in that grade. Now, I think there were probably if you're talking about where did teams land for the most part, if I was to grade the Air 31 teams. I don't think they're landing at average at a C. I think they're landing a little bit higher. So maybe this is saying Jacksonville did not have a top 16 draft class. I think there's just somewhere in the middle, though. There were picks that were really nice. There were ones that made a lot of sense. Brian Thomas Jr. was one of those guys that, you know, well, I could look at him and say well, kind of similar to Gabe Davis to start. Same kind of skill set. The upside is there. You know, I think he's he's an interesting player. I think he is still a pretty unique player as well. Like, you do not see a ton of these prototypical build X receivers that are just basically all athleticism. Because I don't, like, watching him, and if you were there for our film breakdown when we did the live stream, you'll have seen it too. If you go watch his film, you'll see it anyway. But he's not that physical. He is not a guy who breaks a ton of tackles. He will break kneecaps uh, when people, you know, or break ankles, not break kneecaps. That'd be like Dan Campbell. But um, <laughs> Brian Thomas Jr., he will juke you out. But if if you get your hands on him, he doesn't break a lot of tackles. He's a very athletic specimen for a six foot three wide receiver of his size. And so I want to see that physicality improve. But it's a very interesting player and a very good one and one that I could have easily seen going much earlier than he did in the draft. So I thought it was a steal uh, based off where we expected him to go. And I think it's a really good target for Trevor and someone who will stick around, who will earn that second contract, I hope. And hopefully yet another good first round pick. But it's a C plus because after the first round, it's a similar story to last year. I think maybe the only difference between what they did with last year's picks in the second and third round, specifically the Brendan Strange pick, was it felt like the absolute ceiling of the strange pick was he would be worth it. That was the best case scenario, that he's this great tight end too, and you would spend a second round pick on that that's late in that round. This year is a little bit better, though, because if Mason Smith works out, I think he's worth more than 48. I think he's worth a late first and early second. You've got other players I can make that example with that I also talked about throughout the video. So it's not as bad as the previous draft class, I would say. Um, we'll see, of course, how the first round picks compare between Anton Harrison and Brian Thomas Jr. But it's also just not a, a very thrilling class to me after you know seeing how many opportunities they had, the players they picked, 
it just feels like they limit themselves and it's i don't know i i get disappointed at times because i feel like the jaguars to be this like super bowl contender they just there's certain things that they don't do they don't get steals late in the draft they have to spend money all the time at a point that catches up to you and that's probably what frustrates me the most and why this isn't a super high grade because i'm not convinced right now that they got steals in this class i don't think they got a ton of them i think other draft classes are probably going to be better and i think most of them will probably end up being better realistically we'll see what happens uh, we have a really good coaching staff to help out though that's one thing i'm very confident in with this team so that's what I've got, guys. Love to hear your thoughts on what you think the grades were for all these picks for the whole draft class. I think this is a very fair grade for what they did. And if I was going to be more cynical, I could put it even lower. But C plus, I think, is good. I think that's where they landed. We'll see how it is. You know, these these grades are not saying these. This is how the players are going to be. It's not saying this is exactly what they're going to do in their NFL career. What it's saying is it based off the film evaluation, based off the entire process and how we choose these players and who we decide is worth a pick, this is how good the selection was. And I think that's fair. We'll go revisit this, you know, in a couple of years and, and see what we think. Um, maybe that'll be something we do during the offseason, revisiting draft classes, maybe three or four years down the road. It'll be fun once we get to do these for, you know, maybe three or four years and then get to rewatch the videos. But we'll see. Um but thank you all for watching. I appreciate your time here. Let me know your thoughts on it, of course. And that's all we've got on the 2024 NFL Draft. We're going to shift gears towards next offseason. Um, sorry, not, not next offseason. We're going to shift gears to the next season. We'll be looking at the 2025 class a little bit. And we'll be talking, of course, about the things to come very soon. So hope you all have a great rest of your day. Enjoy your weekend. And finally, 